start recording. All right, welcome everybody to the what month is it? March, March 2022 edition of the professionally evil lunch and learn. Uh, man, how is it March already? That's just crazy. Yeah. It feels yeah. like it just turned January. <laughs> it, it did. I think it literally just turned January. Uh, yeah, so my name is Nathan Sweeney. I'm one of the principal security consultants with Secure Ideas. Uh, we do this every month. We get a couple of security pros to jump on and just chat about topics, whatever whatever's going on in the news, whatever comes up. Uh, we're trying as best as we can to kind of recreate the, uh, you know, a couple of guys sitting around at a bar at a security conference, just ranting about uh, whatever the current stuff is going on. So uh, I've got my beer. <laughs> He's got your beer. <laughs> well, I've got, I've got my lemonade. Your lemonade. Okay. I've got a Diet Mountain Dew. Yeah. We never, uh, Maybe it's not quite the the recreation there, um, but uh, if this is the first time you're joining us, feel free to jump in, throw some uh, comments in the public chat there. Uh, we also have a Slack um, channel. I'm trying to find it. There it is. Our professionally evil Slack channel. You can throw stuff in there if you want to. There is a Pell channel or just in general. Um, if you are not a member of professionally evil Slack team, uh, you can get an invite. Just go to professionallyevil.com. I bet somebody will throw that in the in the chat there here in just a second. Uh, and there's a and you can click the button and get a, an invite there and go join. It's just a free Slack team for security professionals to hang out. And um, yeah, we're all in there. Uh, so joining us this month is Aaron Moss, who has been here before, but has never been here as a Secure Ideas employee. So welcome to the team, Aaron. I think it's been about two weeks. Uh, no, I've been here for almost a month now. I think no. actually next week starts is like my official month. Is it really? Oh my maybe. gosh. Wow. How does that happen? I don't know. I'm not sure. Insane. Like I figure by the next time that I'm on Appel again, I won't be working for Secure Ideas. I'm surprised <laughs> I've lasted this long. <laughs> yeah, we are too, honestly, a little bit. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, but, we all get fired uh, relatively often, so. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, it's great to have Aaron uh, officially on our team now. He is based here in Tulsa with me, uh, well, 30 minutes south of Tulsa-ish. I'm uh, in the backwoods. In the backwoods. Uh, down we, by whenever I was Cowetta. still true, we called it true flood zone, and I'm going to start calling it secure ideas flood zone. Uh, yeah. Being that I flooded, you know, uh, what, three years ago in May. Yeah, the big so, one. 36 yeah. inches is about right here of water. That's crazy. So. That's crazy. Also joining us is uh, Alex Rodriguez, um, the other A-Rod. A uh, I, I joked earlier, I've got A-Rod and A-A-Ron uh, on, on this one. <laughs> that was a pretty good comedy. <laughs> nice. Uh, my son is eight, and I haven't shown him. His name is Aaron. No, Aaron is 10, I guess. Uh, I've, got, I've got too many kids. I don't know. But my 10-year-old's name is Aaron, and... Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't think I've showed him that uh, Key and Peel video with AA. How Ron. has he dodged that this long? I don't know. I'm going to make myself a note. He's going to he's going to see that this afternoon. So if you if you haven't seen the uh, Key and Peel uh, video, where what uh, rock are you hiding under for one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, anyway, pr pretty funny video where he's mispronouncing names and whatnot. But so I'm curious the, what yours would be. Anyway, let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the theme of this is basically we just got a bunch of articles and news and events and whatnot. And uh, did you name him after Aaron Clark, that security guy? You know, Aaron, is a, I was checking this attendees. He's not on here. Aaron's been on here several times. No, I did not name. Oh, I did not name after him after Aaron Clark. Um, is it Aaron I'm, Clark security? I don't know who that is. Uh, he, yeah, he, he's, I don't know how to, he's, he's Aaron. <laughs> he's the other Aaron, another Aaron. Um, so let's let's jump in. Uh, we've got a bunch of articles. There's a bunch of stuff going on, um, and honestly, I mean, some of this stuff, like I'm sure you've all heard about Okta and Lapsus and Microsoft and Ukraine and Russia, and it seems like a lot of this stuff just keeps coming around. It's all in the big news. We'll talk about some of that a little bit. We've got some other interesting things as well, um, but I think the first thing that I I found really interesting this first article. Uh, FBI warns of preliminary Russian cyber activity against American companies. That's a big, long title. Uh, here's the article I'm posting in chat if you want to follow up there. Um, did you guys get a chance to read that or did you see uh, Biden's uh, talk on Monday about it? I, I read it. I didn't get a chance to watch the talk. 
I've heard about it. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, we've all been saying this for a while that, you know, like what's cyber war going to look like? And we talked about, I think actually it was last month. We talked about, you know, how Russia was starting to uh, attack the Ukraine and, and using some uh, like going after critical infrastructure and stuff like that to try to shut some things down, denial of service. There were some banking attacks and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> Crypto Jones says, yeah, but how is that different than normal state sanctioned Russian activity? It, that, uh, that was my thought too, especially after yeah. the next article we're going to talk about. So, but yeah, let's move forward with what we got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so here's, here's my concern. We've talked about what could happen. And we've talked about Russia and China and, you know, other nation states and whatnot um, gaining um, footholds in various places and, and trying to demonstrate access or gain access, stuff like that. I don't know that we've ever had a situation where a, a foreign nation state actor has intentionally tried to be malicious and create massive damage. Have we? I mean, can you guys think of anything where, you know, a situation like that? I... I can't think of, like, I, I don't know of anything like that that has happened. I know there's always been talk about stuff like that for years about the, the grid being vulnerable and this and that being vulnerable, but I don't know of, there's not been any public announcements. I'll just say that of anything that I know of. Yeah. Well, I know that, I think it was, I think it was Russia attacking Ukraine before and they had essentially killed a bunch of their power grid yeah for, yeah i mean yeah oil, so but i think you're talking about like american soil right 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 like i don't think we've seen a situation because that's what biden said mm. on monday was basically like hey this is coming this is going to happen be ready for this um and we've always talked about the possibility but i don't think we've actually seen it happen here yet yeah not a wide scale attack not that i can think of yeah brad brought up north korea and sony um but i i, I I wouldn't quite consider Sony uh, critical infrastructure. Um, you know, maybe we're getting close. <laughs> I mean, if, if they took down Netflix, all right, now we're now, now we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Right? Like, yeah, no, that's uh, you know, it, it goes back to the old if Daryl dies, we riot from The Walking Dead back in you know ten years ago. So, yeah, Sony's not uh, critical infrastructure. Although I think a lot of people will be upset about Spider-Man movies. So. Tony posted an article here. A German attack uh, causes massive damage at Steelworks. I'm not familiar with the details of that situation. Scroll in there. Um, it's not clear. Yeah, so apparently it was a targeted. They used a phishing attack to get in. Um, it's not completely clear just from a brief summary whether that was intended to cause damage or whether that was... Uh, you know, whether it caused damage because of, you know, people were unintentional and whatnot. Um, Crypto Jones says, I always assumed Russian activity with civilian hackers that were not just prosecuted, were just not prosecuted for attacking Western targets. Uh, if the current administration presses them into service against the West, I'm not sure how effective they'd be. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, one of the things that both Russia and China have capitalized on is utilizing third parties um, that can't be directly, right. We can basically say, well, they're not, they're not, you know, we're not responsible for them. We, we can't control what they did. It's not our fault. Um, and then eventually there's been several instances where we put enough pressure on either, in, either China or Russia. Um, and I, I'm using them as the two big examples. I'm sure there's others, but like we pressure them a little bit and they'll be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. We made this arrest and they'll arrest some group and then, you know, keep turning a blind eye to, to the other. So, um, that's something like law enforcement in the U S has never, well, at least I don't think, I don't think anybody's ever accused us of, of doing that, of just kind of quietly letting some of these groups kind of go through and do stuff. Um, but I, I don't know. I, 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 I can't, the only time I ever remember anything like that happening was with, uh, LulzSec whenever they captured that guy who was supposedly the leader and then turned him to it like a government informant. <laughs> Um, yeah, basically using him again, but, but that was, ago. I was going to say that they basically used him to capture the other Lulsuck members, right? right? Like it wasn't a, right. Yeah. Yeah. And on, on that same note, Chris mentioned that water company in Florida where they saw the increased chlorine levels. I do remember oh, yeah. that. 
Um, I don't remember who the attacker was, the aggressor wasn't in that situation. I don't remember they ever actually, did they ever actually find out? I think it was just an, uh, either an individual or a group or something like that. I don't think it was a, I don't think there was any evidence of it being a nation state anyway, but I don't remember sure. I didn't think so. So there's another, uh, there's another article here um, from now it's from Gizmodo. So take that for what you will, but it, but it's interesting. Um, I'm always, I've, I've got a pet peeve when somebody quotes officials, unnamed officials or, you know, people in the white house or whatever. Um, but basically they're countering, you know, President Biden had said, hey, this is what we're looking at. We've got some options. We're considering things here. And then other officials that Gizmodo has access to says, well, those aren't serious. We're really not looking at that. It it's wasn't Gizmodo. As... Gizmodo is just reporting on what NBC had. Oh, they're reporting on what NBC said. Okay, that's And funny. NBC had basically come out. Uh, Ken De 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 Delanian? Delanian? Mm -hmm. uh, had come out on Twitter as well and said, we stand by our story after what uh, Pisaki said. Or said yeah. I, I don't know how you pronounce her name. So, I mean, you've got the president and the, the White House chief of, or not chief of staff, what's her title? The uh, press secretary She's the press saying secretary. one thing. And then you have government officials, unnamed, anonymous, saying something else. I don't know. I, I it, it, I hate to say you don't know who to believe, but you can't really necessarily say, well, you know, the dude that monitors the bathroom and makes sure there's people are washing their hands. Maybe he doesn't have as much information as what the press secretary does. <laughs> Crypto Joe says not planning could mean we already have planned. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty valid. Let's also remember that, um, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, Stuxnet. Yeah. Was u.s based yes. u.s and israel u.s and israel yeah it was u.s based and nobody knew about it i have some friends who knew people personally that worked on that mm -hmm. that didn't know that they were working on that at the time because it was so compartmentalized and then they had somebody bring everything together to, to put all the pieces together so Sure. Um, and of course, that was under the Obama administration. So, well, if you go back and look at like uh, who was the group that dropped all the NSA uh, exploits? Shadow brokers. Shadow brokers, right? The stuff that shadow brokers released, man, when was that? Three or four years ago? 2017. Well, I, I'm, yeah, I'm already losing track. Five years ago, I guess. Uh, yep. The stuff that they released was from like 2003, 2004. So, you know, I mean, it. yes, Stuxnet may have been, like, actually deployed during the Obama administration, but they were clearly working on that level of functionality and, and capabilities for, you know, even for, for probably decades, realistically. I don't I don't know necessarily when they started, but, um, you know, it, well, it was I definitely mean, early in the uh, Bush administration as well. It's 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 obvious that they've been working on this stuff for decades because this is the you know, it's the new frontier of, of warfare which is the reason we're talking about this right now. Yeah. And so if, if you have these kinds of systems that are so critical to the infrastructure and stuff like that, of course, any government nation state is going to be working on some kind of weaponry to be able to dis, you know, disrupt, distract, destroy, uh, as just to try to be in front of the other. It's basically the same thing that we do. We try to get in front of the bad guys, right? Yeah, yeah. And the problem yeah. with the bad guys is the bad guys think that, you know, we're the bad guys sometimes. <laughs> it's evil always thinks evil is doing good, but good always thinks that, it, you know, it's it, it's perspective. Yeah. It's well, and one of the things that it wasn't necessarily an attack on critical infrastructure, but um, it was a big database for government backgrounds. I can't remember what it was, but essentially that had gotten breached and all the information. Oh, you, you talk about the OMB breach? Yes. So that yeah. one was from what I remember, I thought it was supposed to be Chinese based or something. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was 2015, I think. Um, yeah, OPM. that was uh, OPM. So, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't directly to critical infrastructure, but I mean, that's critical information for the U.S. government. Yeah. So. Well, and we we've done some testing for similar agencies. I can't tell you who, but um, 
there was actually one uh, particular government agency in, in, in DC that we were testing, one of the larger ones. And they asked us afterwards, they're like, hey, what are the chances? This was like later, this was like later that year in 2015. And they asked us, they said, what is the chance that we could be an OPM, right? Like what, what is the chance that that could happen to us? And I mean, <laughs> I, I regretted this later. I, I kind of laughed in, in their face in the middle of the meeting um, because it was like, they gave us access to their network just as a normal user. Like we just plugged in and said, hey, right, we were on the network, what could we do? And we had domain admin within like two hours. And we found like four or five methods to get domain admin in the court. In fact, one of them, we sent a phishing email to sysadmins and three of them logged in with, I mean, it was a third party that we were simulating, but they logged in with the same password that they used for their domain admin account, right? They were mm. reusing passwords. So, I mean, it was like trivial stuff like that, that it's like, hey, this stuff is so soft. Um, it just, I, I have to assume that one, other nation states are doing, and that's what I told him. I said, I said, hey, if you're not doing, or if China doesn't already have access to your stuff, they're not trying, you know, that <laughs> it, it's, it's absurd to think that they wouldn't. Um, but I, I've always assumed that they're going after our stuff and we're going after their stuff the same way. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, it'll, yeah. So I, I know one thing that always comes up is, is, is that what can we do if we know this is going to happen? Is there anything that we should be doing differently? You know, like, like Biden and, and the FBI says, Hey, be prepared for the CISA put out some guidance, I think saying, Hey, be prepared. We're going to, this is going to be happening soon. Does anybody take that seriously? Is there anything different you can do? Or is that just FUD? Uh, I, to, to, to answer the first question, I think you gave a really good example of the government agency that you were testing that was doing all that stuff. Yeah, we could do things differently. You know, we can actually follow some guidelines about how to how to put security in place to take care of some stuff, right? Like, don't use reuse passwords. Use some strong passwords. Put in two-factor authentication. You know, st stuff like that. And for a lot of places that aren't doing that, yeah, do it differently. But does and, it matter? You know, does it matter that right. um, businesses don't care until it costs them money? I've had several yeah. clients like that over the years that even if it cost them money, they still didn't care because it didn't hurt them enough to change things. Yeah. You know, but does it matter that I guess my, my point is, you know, everybody's warning, Hey, these, uh, nation state attacks are imminent. Uh, Russia appears to be preparing something big going on and all this. Does that change anything? Like that's not going to, I don't, I don't feel like any either government agencies or, businesses are going to say, oh, let me start investing in security now because yeah. this attack is imminent. You know what I mean? A little bit too late for that. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think it's just still security hygiene, the fundamentals. Yeah. To Tony said, uh, everyone gets religion after a serious incident. <laughs> That's pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. You, could you could probably take that out of context for anything, right? Like, We've all been in that situation. Dear God, please fix this. And I promise, you know, <laughs> I promise I'll go to my church second next divorce. Week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's not go there. Yeah. No, we're not going there. I'm just, I, I, I the, the comment is real. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on here a little bit. I, I thought this was interesting. Um, DIY volunteers are repairing Ukraine's destroyed internet infrastructure. Um, now, this is a Vice article, Great. and so there's always a little bit of drama going to be included there. But um, I've seen this link from several other places on Twitter and whatnot. I think this is awesome. Did either of you guys get a chance to read this one? Yeah, I, I was uh, – excuse me. I was reading through it, actually, um, before we jumped on here. Um, it's actually kind of cool that – I mean, you, you see pictures of people down in literal – you know, in the ditches, in the trenches and stuff like that, like doing fiber work. And you by know? trenches, sometimes you mean like – craters of where yes <laughs> yes you know a, a, a missile blew up yeah bombs blew stuff up and now people are down in those holes like patching cables back together that's pretty yeah, incredible it, it kind of reminds me of i think i had heard stories about during the arab springs uh egypt thing like situation that happened there were actual people that were trying to hack around the government trying to block out the whole country 
And so it kind of reminds me of that. It's kind of, re it's really cool to see that people are doing amazing stuff like this. Yeah. It makes you wonder, uh, I, I've often wondered, you know, go back to the 80s. What was a uh, Red Dawn? You remember that movie? That was fantastic. I was actually going to watch that just the other night because <laughs> of all that's going on. It's like Wolverines. Wolverines, yeah. <laughs> but it makes me wonder, like, would that same would that same thing happen in the U S today? Right. Like, do we still have the same sentiment of, uh, you know, if, if we were attacked by a foreign national, uh, like that, it, would we, you know, are you going to see people binding together and, you know, getting in the trenches and patching cables or I don't know. It, it's interesting to think about. It seems I feel like, like society has changed a common enemy whenever, you know, nine 11 happened and everything, but that wore off after a couple of days. So yeah. I don't know, you know, of course, yeah, with that yeah. said, I mean, I was in a dorm room whenever that happened in college. <laughs> so, you know, I'm very limited on my scope on that, but still. Yeah. I don't think you guys want to know how old I was. <laughs> you were just a baby, weren't you, were, Alex? No. Were you, like, were you born yet, Alex, in 2001? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes, I was born. <laughs> I was six then, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's so, oh, man. That's hard. I, to think about. I couldn't even really process until I got older, really, because like I, I saw the emotional reactions from like my parents and stuff, but like yeah, actually processing anything. everything only happened later on. <laughs> yeah, so, the yeah. Same for thing Aaron, and... with me with the Oklahoma City bombing, whatever that happened, I was in sixth grade, and and they brought us all in. We were making a TV outside, and they brought us all in for that to look at the TV, and we were all just like. Okay, what's happening? We don't understand. Yeah. And now looking back at it, it's like, wow, that's yeah. yeah. I, I was, I was, I had, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna say the only thing I had to relate to that circumstance was we have a lot of family in New York. So thinking about my family that was in New York possibly have gotten hurt. That's the only thing I could really process at that age. Yeah, so, that that sucks. I was thinking of the Challenger explosion. That was about, I think I was six ish. I don't, when, when was that? 86 is what I was thinking. Um, when the Challenger, yeah, that's, I think that's right. Exploded. Yeah, that was a little different because we were all watching it live in the library, and it's like, I don't think that's what's supposed to happen. <laughs> I think I was either three or four. Yeah, whenever that happened, I was not. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I, I, I've, I've just... Your we parents were only about... five or six at that time, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking uh, last month just about how neat it's been to see the Ukraine people binding together and, and you know, helping out with stuff like this. Um, so it's, it's been really cool. And, and, and even, you know, other, other nations coming together to help. Uh, I've got a friend that I used to do CrossFit with that uh, he knew somebody that works in a organization, a charity organization that was on the Poland Ukraine border. And so he just, he works for Tulsa, uh, uh, the sheriff's department. He was on the, the SWAT team for the uh, sheriff's department. So he just took time off and said, Hey, I'm going to Poland. And he's over there now, like helping get materials to refugees and stuff like that. So it, it's that's been pretty cool. cool seeing some of that stuff. That's, hey, really awesome. Yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's or, go ahead. I was going to say, I think especially like seeing how many people are rallying just around the Ukraine-Russian conflict, I think there would be rallying. I don't know how much there will be, though, like how Ukraine already has so much more nationalism compared to, I think, Americans do nowadays. So. Yeah, I think you would see it more in rural areas. I mean, there's clearly a lot more national... I don't know if pride is the right word, but probably patriotism and, and stuff like that um, in more rural areas, whereas in urban areas, it's a little less as common. Yeah. Which makes sense why Red Dawn was, uh, what, like somewhere in like rural Colorado, I think, instead of New York City. I, I, I think it was something that's like what, that. Yeah, that's what I had in mind. It yeah. was in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Before we leave the Russia-Ukraine issue uh there was an article here i thought was really interesting about uh cryptocurrencies and the impact that uh this event has had on those um are either do either of you guys do much with crypto do you have any investments there no i i investments have maybe some because what was it there's a specific app that was like just giving away free cryptocurrency keybase so they were yeah. giving Keybase. So I have 
some money from that, but I don't know even how much it's worth. It could be like two pennies total. <laughs> right. So. If I remember correctly, they were like, if you like, they had tutorials and stuff. And if you walked through those, they would give you some like random, like not random, but like they various currencies, they would give you a little bit of this or a little bit of that, stuff like that. Is that what that's yeah. It was something like that. And it was like, oh, free money. Sure. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, well, it's like the penny stocks of, uh, of crypto, but you never know, right? You never know when it's going to get big. Bitcoin had to start somewhere. Well, and when Bitcoin started, I remember like people were buying pizzas with two Bitcoins, you know, like. <laughs> no, it was like 10. Like, three, yeah. yeah. 10 Bitcoin. And now you're looking at that and you're like, my God. <laughs> yeah. I saw an interview with that guy. It's like, you know, $54,000 or whatever. Or no, it may have been more than that. I don't remember what it comes to, but it's a lot. I think right yeah. now, the last I saw it was somewhere around about uh, 40. Actually, I could tell you what it was this morning. It was 43,931.62. Yeah. 43,000, so almost $44,000 right now. So what what what's interesting about this article, um, the, the whole idea of cryptocurrency is that it's it's got neutrality, right? You can't be influenced by government. It's It's completely separated. The problem is the vast majority of uh, people that buy cryptocurrency don't do it the hard way. They do it the easy way through an exchange. And the exchange tends to be easily manipulated by various authorities. So, for instance, like Coinbase, right? Like Coinbase, you it's easy to buy and sell cryptocurrency through Coinbase. But the U.S. government can also say, hey, if you're going to operate in our territory, you've got to you know, give us access to th this reporting data or require these people to, you know, submit taxes and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it takes away the decentralized, like using a, a centralized uh, uh, exchange like that takes away the decentralized side of it. Um, we saw the same thing in Canada with the, oh, what was the trucker thing? The freedom. That convoy. Protest. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Whatever. When they like surrounded the city, I, I don't even remember now. It was a month ago. I don't remember what it was now. Yeah. We, uh, we slept in the dates. <laughs> yeah. So like, like basically Canada jumped in and said, Hey, we're going to take over and, and uh, you know, confiscated some of the cryptocurrency from those guys um, because they were using centralized uh, uh, exchanges. Um, anyway, it's just, it's interesting. Like as, as we start deploying sanctions to, against russia uh and russia is able to yeah some on both sides people are trying to use cryptocurrency for various things and then finding out hey these aren't quite as uh decentralized or neutral as we thought they were right yeah, yeah. especially yeah I, I think the the big point of that article is the fact that you know they're watching these people and watching these transactions and then blocking those transactions based on who they think is there and everything uh, based on the sanctions and stuff like that, which is really interesting. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, super, super interesting, I feel like. Yeah. That they're, well, they're able to do something like that. Even if they're not able to use whatever centralized thing, what happens whenever a U.S. business pays a ransom? Ooh, I'll there you go. <laughs> He'll be back. Uh, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> I, um, I, nobody needed to see that. <laughs> Um, what happens whenever a U.S. business goes to pay a ransom for like ransomware stuff to a Russian-based authority for the actual crypt, like cryptoware that they've got on their computers and for, stuff? Yeah, for ransomware. Yeah. What that, man? Can we talk about that real quick? Because if you're paying yeah. a ransom, you're really screwing something up. Valid, but it happens. Oh, I know. <laughs> I it mean, happens. that's what the pipe. That's there. what the pipeline thing happened. Yeah, they tried yeah. to pay the ransom and then ended up having to revert from backups anyways, but they paid the ransom. So even if you do have all the proper mechanisms in place, there are still people that pay it. it oh, I, I, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, like I've, I've been in a, a situation at an organization where we didn't have the backups that we needed. We were ransomed and we had to pay the ransom just to get stuff back. Of course, now, you know, after that happened it was like yeah here's some money get some backup stuff okay thank you finally right and so yeah it kind of goes <laughs> on a 56k modem it kind of goes back to um you, you know what can we do differently you know that first yeah. initial question that we asked well that's one of the things we can do differently basic as alex said basic security hygiene yeah 
Yeah, the problem is that how to pay a ransom, or whether to pay a ransom or not. Um, it's really com complicated when you get into the, the business side of thing, because even if you have bad, like I, I worked with an organization uh, that maybe less than a year ago that they were compromised. All of their stuff was encrypted. They had backups and they were going to be able to restore from the backups, but it was going to take a certain period of time. And I think originally the is a, is a smaller organization, but the ransom was like, they asked for 10 Bitcoin. And so the insurance company, their cyber uh, security insurance company, uh, had a negotiator that reached out and said, hey, we can't afford that, but we'll pay you a quarter of a Bitcoin. And they came back and said, how about half a Bitcoin? And they said, sure. It, that 25 grand to that company, whatever it was, 20 grand or 25 grand or whatever they ended up paying, was totally worth it to get the backups, to get, you know, to get, uh, not the backups, to get the data. To get everything back because it was going to be more expensive to get the backups going, correct? Exactly, exactly. And so it was like, you know what? I mean, I think it was the insurance company that made the decision of let's just pay this and move on. It will cost us less in the long run. Um, there, there's a yeah. lot of business decisions in that conversation. I mean, I, I, yeah, I can totally see that. Well, and how do you handle all the different sanctions for Russia yeah, you have to pay Russian hackers to try and get your data back. How well, does that and then, but, can we talk about that for a second? If you're paying, I broke his brain. <laughs> he's he's on a loop now. We just started him over. <laughs> what? You you said can we talk about that for a second? Like you said the exact same thing. Yeah, no, I want to talk about this because here's the thing: if we're paying these cyber criminals, right? So look at it from the business perspective. Fine, I understand you have like an obligation to keep the money flowing and everything. And it's going to cost less to do that. Right. But if we're paying these cyber criminals, because let's face it, that's what they are. They're criminals. We're paying these criminals, these ransoms and stuff like that. And that's just obligation for them to keep going because they know that it works. So yeah. when does the moral obligation overtake the business so, obligation to make money? That's that's, but I mean, that's a question that's way above where we're yeah, at but right it's, now. It's, I think that's an overall, you know? Yeah it's not always just about money. I mean, there's a lot more, there, there's a lot of considerations there, but I, I compare it to like, like if you go to certain places in South America or Central America um, where kidnappings are very common, there is an entire, maybe black markets, the right word economy of like, it's just a process of people get kidnapped. So, you know, the ransom gets paid, the person gets given back and everybody knows you don't harm the, you don't harm the kidnapped person because then it all fall, falls apart and you won't get paid. So that works because law enforcement is not developed well enough to combat it and stop it. And so there's some alternative of, you know, society basically that, that builds up. We're kind of in the same situation now. Our security professionals don't have the ability, us, we don't have the ability to stop ransomware completely. I mean, ideally we should be able to, but people aren't doing it. But we so, have that box. We have the blinky box, right, right. So that that economy is always going to spin up of, you know, finding some way of, hey, we'll take care of your stuff. We'll actually give you the key. You know, we'll try to help you get your data back as long as you pay us because we want the next guy to pay too. I don't, I don't know about the moral side of that, but I don't know that you can stop it. Well, yeah, there's a lot of things that we could talk about from that perspective and everything that I'm not going to get into. Uh, yeah. And you're absolutely right. I think it's one of those things you, you can't stop it. And so, um, but it's just, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting question. I feel like that we're never going to have an answer to. Yeah. And we've been talking about this for forever. I mean, think about like, yeah. uh, you remember Air Force One, Harrison Ford? I've never seen it. Oh my gosh. That's a great I movie. Know, so I know. The movie so starts out. Behind me. Does that look like a movie that I just go out and watch? I mean. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> So it, it starts out with Harrison Ford uh, as president giving a speech somewhere in Europe after a situation with uh, uh, terrorists. And he, he basically says, we will not uh, comply with terrorism. We will not negotiate. We, you right. know, I've this seen is that. who we are and we're going to stand up and, and, you know, this is our moral obligation to fight terrorism and we'll never, we'll never compromise. And then Air Force One gets hijacked with his family on it and all that. And it's, you know, he fights off the terrorists and save the day. But get off my plane. Right. But we we can't all be Harrison Ford, right? Like that's the, that's the problem there. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. I and, and you know, and like I said, I, I I get that. And that's that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up because like there is that, you know, 
it, it's like everything else. There's no black and white on this. Everything's a lot more nuanced. Yeah. And the nuances, I think, in the gray area is, is where everything really uh, either comes together or falls apart. Hey, and you so know what? It's, we- it's good to have those perspectives and talk about this stuff so that we can all get a better idea, you know? I, I forgot. We actually have an article talking about ransomware. I just pulled this up, Dark Reading. Um, basically, uh, it's pretty straightforward, but it, ransomware payments and demands rose dramatically in 2021. Uh, this was uh, uh, from Unit 42 that did the analysis. I think that's an Israeli group, isn't it? Um, no, that's Palo Alto's reverse engineering. Oh, like yeah. I said, like I said, it's Israeli, right? <laughs> Isn't that where Palo came from originally? No, they're from uh, California. They're they're based in California. I was thinking they started like the the folks that started it were Israeli. Maybe I'm wrong. The um, found, I can't remember what the nationality of the founder is, but so they said uh, according to their study, uh, cyber extortion attacks jumped by 85 percent last year, and payments rose by 78 percent. The average ransomware payment rose by seventy eight percent. So the average is now five hundred and forty one thousand dollars. That's just in crazy. That's crazy how much money we're talking about. Near Zook is is Israeli American, so yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was. I'm pretty sure it was an Israeli group that started it. Um, He's gosh. a former engineer from Checkpoint and NetScreen, according to uh, according to the good old Wikipedia. Yeah. Anyway, um, go ahead. Yeah, but I mean, they, they, they saw a 144% increase in ransom demands to $2.2 $2 million. <laughs> Brad, inflation everywhere. Yes. Inflation everywhere. That's so right. Much. Even so the ransomware is going <laughs> So much. Yes. Well, and I actually, I heard on a podcast too, it's kind of interesting the tension between the different hacking groups that were before Russian Ukrainian and how that's tr- like, how the actual war is affecting that relationship of their normal ransom group gangs that were doing that stuff. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember what it was. I think it was, uh, it was a podcast. Hmm. What was it? Yeah. I, what was the, uh, what was the, the risky business? That's what it was. I, I okay. Wondered, I was going to ask if it was risky business. Risky business. Yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, what is his name? Something Gray. Patrick Gray. Patrick Gray. Yeah. Uh, he does a great job. If you guys don't listen to the Risky Business Podcast. Um... Oh, wow. We are all disconnected. Okay, good. I'm glad it wasn't me because I thought I dropped off too because you froze at the same time, Alex. <laughs> How funny. There you I go. bet it's the Russians. It, I'm, I'm going to blame it on the Russians. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Yeah, uh, the the Conti Malware Gang. Oh, so it's funny that uh, Crypto Jones brought up the Conti Malware Gang. We've got an article here on exactly how much uh, the Conti hacking group members get paid. Um, so now this is a hacking group, right? And a lot of different people that are, I don't know. It, it's really interesting when you look at some of the analysis of how these groups form. Uh, Krebs has done some stuff on that. Um, but if you scroll down in that article, there's a, this was the January 2020 to March 2022 uh, difference. Um, hold on. Oh no. Okay. This was secure, uh, secure works analyzed the logs of 500 individuals. So 500 individuals in that group that got paid 81 involved in payroll with an average salary of $1,800 per month. That's not a ton. That is very low actually. Yeah. But you've got some people like the main team. So 52 people got $97,000 in the wrong business. We are. That's <laughs> well, yeah. the other thing you got to think oh, about is a thousand eight hundred dollars per month might be amazing in whatever currency they're that's, living in. That's, oh, that's a good point. That's a that good point. Yeah, 100%. Especially in so, the, you know, like, I mean, Nigerian scams and stuff like that, you know. Right? Yeah, Tony <laughs> yeah. said it's not a bad side hustle. Well, uh, the uh, Oh, thanks, Crypto Jones. He, he included the de- the full length details. Um, the group, ah, bloody hell, Lapsus. Uh, supposedly Lapsus, like in London, they arrested, I don't know if it's London, but somewhere in Britain, they arrested like seven teenagers that they believe are primarily the people behind Lapsus. Like 1,800 bucks as a teenager? 1,800 bucks as a month? That would be, a you month? know. Yeah. 
<laughs> Can you imagine if, if as a teenager, someone said, hey, here's 1800 bucks a month? I'd take it. <laughs> yeah, I'd have three problem. Xbox Series Xs. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's hard to... I don't know how we compete against that. Because kids are always going to be smarter than their parents. And, you know, they, they've got more time than the rest of us because we're trying to do jobs and, you know, we've got families and commitments and whatnot. And they've got the free time to just poke and learn and, and explore whatnot. I don't know how we stop that. Yeah, I don't have any kids, but I can Take imagine it's, I can imagine it's keeping them engaged in other areas. <laughs> yeah. So. That's, that's something, something I can think of. It, yeah, exactly, Alex. I mean, that's something that, you know, like um, law enforcement and, and social um, social workers, stuff like that have been doing in other areas here just, you know, in America to, to try to keep kids out of gangs, right? I mean, if, if, if anything, this is virtually kind of – virtually, literally, virtually kind of the same thing as, as a gang, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, if you can get them – everybody's just trying to find a place to belong. My daughter – is she struggles with stuff like this. You know, I mean, not not this, but, you know, just trying to find a place to belong. And so... I was going to say, which hacking group is she in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, she She's a member of, uh, of the, uh, the Halloween hacking group where she goes out and, you know, finds people to hack up. So... Um, nice. All my she's kids are in the war, so... Yeah. But... Um, all right, let's let's move on here a little bit. Uh, we've talked about ransomware and, and and all this stuff for a while, hacking groups. But um, I know Alex, you oh wanted to talk God. a little bit about crypto Jones Robux. That's fantastic. <laughs> Imagine having to convert fourteen million dollars in cryptocurrency to Robux just to convert it into U.S. dollars. Uh. <laughs> you know what? I, I'll be honest. If I went to my thirteen-year-old and I said, "Hey, I've got fourteen million dollars, and I need to convert it to Robux, and then somehow." convert that to dollars i bet he'd figure out a way to do it <laughs> like i bet he would figure out a scam so that we could make it happen he'd probably, probably be yeah. like how much of a cut do i get <laughs> yeah 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 Th thanks for clarifying if you're not if you're not familiar robux is the virtual current virtual currency of roblox <laughs> oh, Ro roblox yeah and if you're not familiar with roblox well god bless you you're awesome uh because the rest of us have been inundated with it by our kids uh, so it, it's, it's a, it's a neat little game. that's all kind of Minecrafty to a degree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the article that until Nathan comes back, um, yeah, it was posted in the chat was essentially talking about, um, I don't know if anyone's, or if people had heard about the vulnerability dirty pipe, um, it's a Linux vulnerability. Oh, I think he's coming back. He I've been here the whole time. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Nope. Yep. You should have. You should have said nothing. Like <laughs> I <laughs> could have totally had him going for another twenty seconds. I yeah, was tempted to, but we're being recorded. So. I, well, and that's the reason I was thinking maybe we go ahead and do it. It'd be funny. Yeah. Um, clearly, the, the internet is broken. <laughs> it's, it's still Russia. It's, yeah. it's still Russia. Uh, go ahead. Talk about dirty pipe. Yeah. So. Uh, Alex, can you summarize Dirty Pie? Essentially, it was a flaw in the Linux kernel that, um, and this was my brief understanding of it, is that you can essentially get privilege escalation while using pipes between commands to actually become an assumed root. Um, and so I think it was Risky Business that I had heard about this. They had, there are certain people that had actually taken the dirty pipe vulnerability and started using it against Android phones. So it's all types of Linux devices. Yeah. Um, and they've already submitted patches to Google for the upstream kernel for it, but it's going to take a while for that to propagate to the different manufacturers. So, well, just, and, and how many devices never get updates or never, you know, people yeah. never get around to patching and yeah, it's crazy. It's, if you guys aren't, if you're not familiar with dirty pipe, I just posted the, um, the original write-up of the dude that found it. And it's actually a pretty good read. It does get really technical once you get down to like, okay, how to exploit it. Um, but the summary of like how he discovered it is, is, I thought it was pretty interesting. Basically he had a problem and he was troubleshooting it and he couldn't, he couldn't find any excuse for why this was working. And then he got to the point where he realized, oh, wow, this is a kernel flaw in, in the actual Linux kernel, which is, 
that's pretty exciting to find, right? Like you don't see that that kind yeah. of thing very often. Well, and the interesting uh, thing too is that it was released in I think it was five point eight in newer. So the older kernels actually aren't affected by it, which is just so strange to think about. Yeah. Hmm. There you go. Yeah, so, so don't pa don't patch your stuff. Don't and you'll be perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now it also says in the, in that that write up from Keller that uh, you know uh, it's similar to uh, Dirty Cow, but easier to mm -hmm. exploit. Now, if anybody knows anything about Dirty Cow, there was that. a uh, an image, of course, like so many other vulnerabilities that are out there, an image released uh, for Dirty Cow, and I'm hoping to God that nobody releases an image for Dirty Pipe because I can already tell that there's going to be some not safe for work stuff out there. Just saying. Yeah, do, do not do not search for that. <laughs> Let's just say that, or at least do not do not search for that at your work computer. Add uh, exploit to the end of it. That might help. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to help or not. That may make things oh, worse. Gosh, take it. Anyway, um, but yeah, Dirty Cat was kind of an interesting exploit because yeah, it was uh, you know it was a, a, a privilege escalation and everything. I've actually used it once or twice in tests to to get root access on a system so he says it's easier to exploit i'm definitely interested i haven't done a linux test in forever so i'm you know it's going to probably be a while before i get around to testing this or whatever um there's but, actually i was getting ready to look at it before we had started the call but i didn't have a chance to there's already a metasploit module for it apparently yeah i so. think i think this is going to be like a, a mso 8067 like th this is going to be a vulnerability that we see <laughs> forever in various organizations um yeah. that you know just it, it's a reliable exploit that that gives you access to to linux because you're gonna yeah. have you're gonna have camera systems and phone systems and you know time clocks and thermostats and you know all of those devices that nobody ever actually patches or you know some third-party vendor is responsible for i think we're gonna see those in environments forever yeah probably yeah. so I mean, yeah. 17010 is still, I mean, most people are patched against that now, but I mean, it's, yeah, it, it, if I see an 08067, I'm definitely seeing a 17010. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Fausto, Fausto brought up the browser and the browser uh, phishing attack. Did you, did you guys see that one? I haven't seen that. No, I was, I was just about to click on that actually, because I don't. So I don't it's, this. it's neat. Part of me was like, oh, don't publicize that because we've used stuff like this before. Um, you know how with federated authentication, you go to a website and you say, I want to, I'm going to click the button to log in as Google and it pops up a, a Google uh, window and you log in there and then that window goes away and the, the actual website loads up. Basically what this guy demonstrated is, is like I said, stuff that we've used for phishing in the past where that window that pops up, you don't actually have to pop up a Google window. You can use JavaScript and you can basically create what oh looks like a window. Oh my design. god! Oh, oh yeah. I totally see where you're going with that already. That is a it, so it, brilliant from the user's perspective. Idea. Yeah, I mean that's been like like Mick, uh, uh, one of our consultants, is amazing with JavaScript. He's he's probably the smartest guy I know when it comes to JavaScript. I think um, he invented JavaScript, didn't he? Maybe. Yeah. If you, actually, if you go to Stack Exchange. I don't know if he still is, but he used to be like in the top five for answered questions oh around, related to JavaScript. Um, but that was always his thing. It's like, you know, yeah, we can pop up alerts. We can do all this kind of stuff, but it's a lot easier just to pop up a login and say, you know, you have to re-log in your, you know, your session expired or whatever. Everybody just types in your credentials and then done. Now you've stolen their credentials. Um Crypto says, now you know how the NSA feels watching its collected exploits be announced. That's exactly right. Yeah. No, I mean, that that's the thing. It's like if people, when people are trained to, they see something and they perform an action, right? They see the window pop up, they type, type in their credentials and they move on. You can take advantage of that. It's There's no way to know for sure, or there's no way to, to completely know for sure you're not being exploited in that, that type of scenario. Um, yeah. I had seen that before. I didn't realize there was an actual name for it, though. That's pretty cool. Well, it's it's fairly new. That guy named it. Um, I don't know. That link that, that, that Fausto posted is, is fairly recent. God. March 15th, so wow. 10 days ago. I don't know it's why a good read, though. didn't think of this before. Like, that's a that's a brilliant attack. Well, like, like I said, I, I think people have been doing this for a while. I know we've done it. Um, 
I'm, I'm not going to give examples because we still use some of that. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I'm still new to the group, and we yeah. didn't do stuff like this back at True. Uh, I was mainly focused on network pen tests. I'm sure I probably thought of some weird stuff like this on a network pen test, but not a web app. So Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, that's kind of interesting is um, I saw, I think it was part of, it was either DEF CON or Wild West Hacking Fest. This guy gave a demonstration of he in, inserted a Unicode character that is normally used for converting left to right text to right to the left. Yeah. So what you could do is you could spell Microsoft.com backwards as your domain name, and that's what you register. But then whenever you go to send the email, you put the Unicode character there, and it flips it to spell at Microsoft.com. And so you could put whatever you want in front of your email address. And it looks like it's coming from Microsoft. I still wasn't able to find an actual POC of it, but it's really crazy what you can do with that stuff. That's nuts. yeah. That's uh that's, that's one of the old ways. I haven't seen it for a long time, but we used to be able to get past um, uh, web application firewalls and intrusion prevention stuff with that. You just, you know, change your exploit right to left and then have, and then have the other character change it back at the end. And so that would bypass the WAF because it doesn't look malicious but then the actual server would flip it around and, you know, pull off the exploit. Yeah. So, all right, we are, we're getting close to the end of the hour. Um, I, I thought, I thought this one was interesting. Um, so related to the pandemic and workforces and, you know, we've said forever that cybersecurity has a, a negative unemployment rate and, and whatnot, but now it's getting even worse, having a hard time finding enough people to work jobs. Um, I know Aaron, you just recently changed positions, Alex, you haven't for a while. Um, but it, it just, it feels to me like everybody is hiring. Everybody's looking for people and there's just, there aren't enough out there. And I don't know. I should have demanded more that. money. Yeah. <laughs> you should have. Uh, I'm going to tell my boss. Oh, Hey boss. I'm telling you, I should have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like we made an offer to a, a developer, um, recently, and uh because we're building out some stuff and he he said hey i really want to work with you but i got this other company that's willing to pay me significantly more i mean way more than we could you know we couldn't even counter and um you know it's like hey great and, and he said he's like hey it might be a toxic job it may not be what i want to do but for that much money i can do it for a while i can't I, you know i can't blame that but it's just weird what's happening to the economy with you know different offers out there like that yeah, I mean, I, I totally get that, but I, I wanted to come here, so. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's what I've always said. I've got, I, I get contacts from recruiters all the time, but I can't, I, I can't even imagine what I would, you know, want to leave. Yeah. So just to kind of tail off of what Crypto Jones is saying about the, if you're willing to pay for it, talent's out there. I yeah. think the issue is, is that there's also so many people that are applying and inundating job postings that it's difficult to weed through the people that are talented and yeah. have the actual skills to do it. So like, unless you know someone in the company and they know you have those skills, it's extremely difficult because there's lots of people applying for these jobs and it's impossible for people to get through all the job applications that they've been given. I, 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 I think mean, that's, fair. I think the article is stating the exact opposite of that, but I mean, I, I, I agree with what you're saying too. Yeah. Well, I yeah. specifically, my wife had been talking about, she saw on LinkedIn that a person that was hiring for a software developer job had over, I think it was 1,800 applications within the first day. Yep. And well, so and, it's and like, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So no, I was going to, I was going to comment exactly what you're saying. Like part of it, that, that article was saying that um, 60% of companies have problems retaining Cybersecurity professionals in 2021, which goes to what crypto was crypto saying about Jones people not paying enough. Exactly. Yeah, but mm, to, to Alex's perfect. point, like we in the last several months, we've gotten so many uh, resumes, and it's like, all right, on paper this looks good, and then you get to talking to people, like you know, actually doing an interview, and it's like, all right, you say you know this, but what you mean is you've heard of this and you clicked a button and ran a tool one time. You know what I mean? Like that 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 deeper understanding, you know, yeah. of what I would consider necessary for a senior level person. It's just not there as much as people think. Yeah, I agree. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people, in, in, and I think a lot of it goes to, I mean, I've been that guy, right, where I thought I was hot stuff and, and knew everything, and whenever I actually started doing this stuff, I realized exactly how much I didn't know because there's, you know, the, the InfoSec space is like this, and I'm just a little blip right in, the, you know, somewhere on the outer edge of it. Right. And I think there's a lot of people like that that are – um that are kind of like that. But going back to what, you know, crypto said, you know, if you're willing to pay for it, the right people will come along. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's challenging trying to hire at this point with it's, it's just, it's extremely complicated. Um, but anyway, all right, well, I'm going to wrap it up there. It's 1256. We got about four minutes, but we're going to, we're going to end a little bit early. Um, just because I have another call right on the hour that I, that I couldn't bump. So yeah. And um, I got Aaron. Go <laughs> Aaron and or AA Ron and A Rod. It was great having you guys. I'm glad the internet stayed with us long enough to get here. Uh, <laughs> Everyone's internet apparently. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got pity for our folks that are gonna have to try to clean up this video and you know put it on YouTube. It's gonna we'll be awful. It'll, yeah, who knows what it'll end up, but um, <laughs> everybody else, thanks for attending. I, I love all the, the chatter and the conversation. Uh, that really contributes to the uh, the conversation. So I appreciate that. And, Thanks, Crypto. Uh, yep, we will see you all uh, next month. I feel like we need like an outro song to go here. Yeah, uh, I think L actually adds outro song music to the. Oh, does she? Because I was thinking. Do, 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 do. <laughs> okay, no. Well, there you so, go. You, you got it. <laughs> yeah. No, so, no, so no. here, here's the challenge: if we use music like that, as soon as we publish it to YouTube, they'll challenge it and take it down. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, that's the reason I just hummed it just now, so that yeah. you know it's, it's not the actual song or anything. Um, it's uh, it's a really terrible rendition. Yeah, it. yeah. All right, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording and we'll jump off here. Everybody have a good uh, afternoon and enjoy your weekend. Bye, guys. Bye. Right, see ya.